Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Robert Puentes. I'm the president and CEO of the Eno Center for Transportation. And I want to welcome you to the latest in our Eno uh, Center for Transportation webinars. Can you hear me okay? Uh, today we present congestion pricing in New York and beyond. As folks probably know, several cities around the world, places like Singapore and Stockholm uh, and London, charge fees for driving in high traffic areas at the busiest times of day. The justification is that vehicles entering those areas impose costs, things like congestion, carbon emissions, and they do damage to the roads. And back in 2006, Sir Rod Eddington, who chaired a national study on transportation's impact on the UK's productivity, stability, and growth, called congestion pricing an economic no-brainer because no dense city um, like London um, can, uh, can afford to have the kind of congestion they have um, if they don't allocate road space uh, efficiently. But while these congestion pricing systems have worked elsewhere, no American city has really tackled it in any comprehensive way. New York City has come the closest uh, on several occasions. And while there was optimism that that city would finally be the first one to put a comprehensive congestion pricing scheme in place, last month the state put in place a narrow scheme uh, to tax and cap ride-sharing vehicles like Uber and Lyft in order to reduce traffic and raise revenue, mostly for transit. So now transportation experts and advocates around the country are wondering what's next. So to help us understand what's next, we're very happy to be joined by Kate Slevin. Kate is Vice President of State Programs and Advocacy at the Regional Plan Association uh, in New York. RPA is a well-established research planning and advocacy, ac advocacy organization focused on improving that region's prosperity, equity, health, and sustainability. They just released a um, excellent report called the Fourth Regional Plan, which included a recommendation for congestion pricing in that region. So Kate is here to talk about congestion pricing and where that program stands in New York today. We're then gonna have plenty of time for questions and it's my hope we'll also start to consider how all this may play out beyond New York uh, and around the country. So for those listening in, you're encouraged to submit questions and comments through the questions function on the webinar website. You don't have to wait until the speakers are done to submit questions, you can submit them at any time. I'm sure you're going to find this discussion interesting and timely, and I want to thank you all again for taking the time to join us here today. And with that, take it away, Kate. Great. Thank you so much. It's great to be um, speaking with you all today. Um, before I talk about congestion pricing, I want to talk a little bit about RPA and provide some context for the transportation challenges in New York City. Regional Plan Association is a nonprofit civic group working here in the New York metropolitan area which includes three states and 782 municipalities, one of which is New York City. We do research, planning, and advocacy for better mobility, equity, equity and sustainability for our region's 23 million residents. We were formed nearly 100 years ago, and every generation, true to our name, as Rob mentioned, we put together an actual plan for the region, and we just released our fourth regional plan in November, the culmination of four years of research, outreach, analysis, and debate. Our previous plans have helped shape our region from transportation infrastructure to open space. We lay a blueprint out for how this region should grow and then work with governments or pressure them on occasions to get things done. Our region, third regional plan in 1996 included a recommendation to toll automobiles driving into Manhattan. One of the key findings of the fourth regional plan is that New York City is sucking up the job and population growth in our region. This is entirely split from the previous generation when most of the job growth was in areas outside the five boroughs of New York City. This is good for public transit proponents because dense cities, as you all know, allow more people to get around by sustainable modes. But it has come with some serious challenges. Our recent form of growth has led to worsening inequality and segregation, for example, and a se severe affordable housing crisis. And for our transportation network, it's put an intense strain on our public transportation system and roads. We've also seen a startling change over the past few years. For decades, New York City's growth resulted in higher and higher transit ridership and lower rates of proportional car use and we were becoming greener and greener in terms of how we got around. But recently, that trend has started to shift and even reverse itself. 
Transit ridership has slowed and started declining. Buses have seen particularly striking declines. On the flip side, for hire vehicle trips are booming, as you can see by this chart here. In the past four years, New York City ride hail app pickups have grown from zero to 15 million trips per month. We are adding 70,000 people a year approximately, approximately 100,000 jobs, but we are no longer growing in a sustainable or equitable way. This has caused tremendous congestion. In fact, things have gotten so bad in our subway system that our friends at the advocacy group Riders Alliance created a book of subway horror stories. Here are some of the titles of the stories to put it in context for you all. I walked 46 blocks home. It's like a pack of sardines and every morning begins with being shoved. These are some of the images of our trains right now. It's not pretty. RPA's fourth plan says let's take a moment to pause and think about how we should be growing and do it intentionally. We can't continue to grow in ways that worsen inequality and our environment. So instead of starting with growth, we start with values, equity, health, prosperity, and sustainability. We want a region where all people of all incomes, races, ages, and genders have equal opportunities to live full, healthy, and productive lives. And we don't want to further consolidate wealth or transportation choice to a select few. And fixing our transportation system is a vital part of this. Our problem statement in the fourth plan is that we've dramatically underinvested in our region's transit system as demand has grown and technology has changed. We call for both short and long-term solutions. And here are some of our ambitious recommendations, which I won't go into too much detail now. Um, credit for this really goes to our broader team here, Rich Barone, Jeff Zupan, Tom Wright, Chris Jones, for helping to develop these ideas. You can read much more about these at fourthplan.org, and I hope you do. Most relevant to the discussion today, though, is that the plan says we absolutely need new revenue to address these problems and implement these solutions, and congestion pricing is one of the best ways to raise that revenue. Before I go into detail about where we are in congestion pricing, everyone on the call needs to understand a few basic facts about New York City to help frame the dialogue. So here are some key points. Um, over half of our households in New York City don't even own cars. Households with cars make about twice as much on average as households without cars. Only 4% of New Yorkers drive to work in Manhattan in the CBD. The outer boroughs, or Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, and Staten Island residents have been very re resistant to new tolls. New York City needs state authorization to levy new taxes or fees on its citizens. And we are pro a progressive city, but we are also not very welcoming of change. And we have a really messed up toll structure where we have tolls on some bridges leading into the densest part of the country and not on others. And we have 8.6 million opinions about things, especially from the outer boroughs. This chart shows in orange the, the free bridges leading into Manhattan and blue the toll bridges. So people gravitate naturally towards the free bridges causing congestion in nearby neighborhoods. Our first real shot at congestion pricing was in 2007 when Mayor Bloomberg announced a proposal as part of the city's sustainability plan called Plan YC. It was a really exciting day for all of us at the Natural History Museum and many of us were thrilled to help advance the ideas into reality. The proposal was modeled after London, but unlike London, our city did not have the ability to implement the plan ourselves. We needed state authorization, and that's a challenge we continue to face. I'm sure many of you face similar issues in terms of needing county or state approval for your local transportation initiatives. We had a huge coalition of support of congestion pricing and the broader proposals in Plan YC. My organization at the time, I ran a group called the Tri-State Transportation Campaign that's still very active here in New York. 
We released fact sheets showing that 95% of New Yorkers wouldn't be affected by the charge. We then got $354 million um, promised by the federal government as part of the Urban Partnership, Pro um, uh, Partnership Program. Every or editorial board in, here in New York supported congestion pricing. 67% of New Yorkers in public opinion polls said they supported congestion pricing if the money went to mass transit. We had this great rally in Times Square, as you see here, rallies all over the city. And the city council approved the plan and endorsed a home rule resolution. But the proposal died at the hands of the state assembly, who didn't even bring it up for a vote. Sheldon Silver, the speaker of the assembly at the time, who's a powerful broker here in New York, didn't even bring the plan to a vote. But the transit funding crisis was ongoing. A year later, another plan was developed. This time it was from a commission created by then Governor Patterson. It called for tolls on the bridges and a new tax on payrolls in the MTA service area, which is broader than just New York City and includes some of the surrounding suburban counties. And all this money would go to fund the MTA. While some of the new taxes made it through, particularly the payroll mobility tax, a self-described group called the Four Amigos killed the tolling proposal in the state Senate. They were Democrats and were newly in the majority of the Senate. The Senate has tended to skew Republican here in New York for some time. So they stopped the new tolls from making it into the final plan that was approved by the state legislature. I should mention here now that three of these four people have actually been convicted of crimes or are in jail. And I should also mention that Sheldon Silver, who blocked um, Mayor Bloomberg's proposal, is also in court for corruption charges and no longer in office. So we joke here that maybe the moral here is that if you oppose congestion pricing, you might be going to jail. But seriously, our transit funding crisis has continued and gotten really a lot worse. Governor Cuomo last summer said he was open to congestion pricing. He declared a state of emergency to fix the subways. Advocacy groups have stepped up pressure to help on him to help to get him to fix the system. And so he set up a panel of experts called the Fix NYC panel to look into fixing transit and reducing congestion. They relied a good amount on ideas from a coalition that had continued to support congestion pricing since 2009, the Move New York Coalition, of which RPA was an active member. What Fix NYC came up with is really a smart approach. It calls for generating revenue to improve transit up front before you turn the new tolls on and implement the plan in phases while addressing congestion and the rise of four higher vehicles on our streets. But the politics have shifted now, and now we have Mayor de Blasio, who is, is not a supporter of congestion pricing. He opposed it when he was in the city council for a prior iteration, and though he seems more open to the idea now than he was last year, he spent much of last year calling the idea a regressive tax, which is simply not true if you look at the numbers. But many of us worked to get the Fix NYC panel recommendations into the state budget, which New York adopted on April 1st. But we faced similar opposition in prior years, especially from outer borough elected officials who are still unconvinced of the benefits. Trust in the MTA remains low, which is a barrier for us. And building big transit projects here is very expensive and more expensive than anywhere in the world, further, furthering um, people's impression of the MTA. We were partially successful though, we got approval of a new four hire vehicle fee, which will generate $400 million at least annually. And this money will be dedicated to boost transit for service, which is a critical first step to addressing our problems. And we certainly aren't giving up. We still have a very strong um, coalition of groups in support, and then we know it won't be an easy road. The governor has still said, has said that the first um, step was implementing the four higher fees, and he's committed to doing a broader congestion pricing scheme. In order to, to win, we certainly have some work to do. We need to continue to debunk the idea that congestion pricing is a regressive tax on the outer boroughs and build some trust in the MTA. We have new leadership there, which is great. Andy Byford recently took over New York City Transit and has already announced a bus turnaround plan, but he will need to deliver 
and help, it, help address the concern that the MTA does not deserve more resources. And us as advocacy groups and planners, we need smarter messages and to better understand the concerns of people to change public opinion. New York City is a, a very diverse and crazy place and what resonates in one place will not resonate in another. So if anyone wants to join us in Albany over the next year, as we keep fighting for congestion pricing, and you know we'll be there a lot, um, you're welcome to, to join us. We have a great view of the harbor here and you're welcome to RP anytime. Just make sure to bring your walking shoes or your bike share pack because as I said, our transit system is a total mess. All right, thanks, that's all I have today. I look forward to the questions and answers. Hey, that's great, Kate. Thank you very much. Um, very entertaining, very funny. Um, we have plenty of time for questions, so a couple are coming in already. I want to encourage everybody to submit the questions through the questions function on the uh, webinar website. Uh, let me just start off with one, and you kind of hit at this right at the end, and it's kind of the elephant in the room that folks always talk about. I mean, clearly, congestion pricing um, is framed as being regressive, as are most fuel taxes and sales taxes, things like that. You mentioned that one thing that you're planning to do over the next few weeks and months is to fight against that perception. So how are you going to do that? How do you frame that if that's a dominating narrative? Well, I think we've, we, we've been using the numbers, and I think we've made some progress on that um, in the past year or so. We've been working with an anti-poverty group here in New York called Community Service Society, who's done great research um, to show that this is simply a progressive and not a regressive tax. Um, their study recently just put out, I think last year, found that just 4% of employed New York City outer borough residents commute to jobs in Manhattan by vehicle and could be um, subjected to the congestion fee. And, you know, for those the small number of people that are lower or moderate incomes that do commute by car into Manhattan, you know, maybe there's carve outs for those people. So I think addressing those issues up front and continuing to reiterate that this is progressive policy especially if you combine it with something like a reduction in fares uh, for on transit passes for lower income New Yorkers, I think will really help make the case and um, help turn it around. That's great. And so then what is the overarching kind of narrative in New York? I, know, I think when Mayor Bloomberg was talking about this back, as you said, in the, in the late, about 10 years ago, it was around Plan NYC. And it was about how the region was growing. Is it what is it today? Is it around congestion? Is that what's winning the, the day? Is it reinvesting in the transit system? What is the overarching narrative and rationale for it today? I'd say the overarching narrative is the transit crisis. Um, there is a transit crisis. Everyone agrees there's a transit crisis. And so that is that is the, the, the kind of situation we're in. Um, congestion has really gotten terrible, um, especially in Midtown. Some of those charts I showed, you know, put numbers to that. Um, and so that's that's been a, a narrative as well. It's just that I think there's just been a, 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 a an overarching theme though that the subways are in a state of crisis, the buses are in a state of crisis, and for us, you know, being a regional organization, this extends well beyond just the subways and buses. Metro North, Long Island Railroad, New Jersey Transit, we're all kind of you know suffering here. Yeah, sure, sure. And so that kind of gets to the, there's a, there's a lot of questions and comments on that subject. So the short answer then to the question of whether or not congestion pricing is about um, raising revenue or reducing congestion is that the answer is it's, it's kind of both, right? Because it all both. works together. Is both. that what you're saying? It's both. And that was the, the Fix NYC panel that I mentioned. Their charge was to address both. Got it. So how do you, there's a, a lot of actually questions. It looks like folks looking for advice, I think, around the country. And it generally, I'm just trying to summarize some of these questions and concerns. How do you convince folks that, um, how, do you, how do you have this argument with folks who believe that driving should be free and that tolls are anathema in many parts of the country? Well, it's hard to um, ask people to pay for things that are currently free. Um, so one thing we've been doing is to try and focus on what people would get, the real life benefits for them. Um, you know, whether that's improved bus service on a specific line, whether that's improved traffic safety because of reduction of cars in their neighborhood, um, and really meet them where they're at in terms of their concerns. We've also been showing them the numbers. I mean, a lot of elected officials, because of busy schedules, they end up driving around, so they don't necessarily 
see the city as, as we do from, from the transit systems. Um, so showing them the numbers and saying, well, we know you commute to work, but you know, 50 to 80 to 90 percent of your constituents actually use um, do not use their cars to get to work. They're using other forms of, of, of transportation. Right, right. And that would, I think, resonate with the business community. I think in a lot of places, a lot of metros around the country, the business leadership is very vocal on a lot of these transportation issues, investments, new strategies. What was this? What What was the role of the business community in New York in this last go around on this uh, on this plan? They've been They've been very involved. Um, you know, the, they were very involved in 2007 and and throughout the past decade or so, and they continue to be very involved. Um, the real estate community knows that that the success of their companies rely on public transit and rely on a functioning subway system. Um, and I think you know a lot of people, a lot of the businesses that have been here a long time really care about New York and want it to to survive. And so there's a civic interest in in, in improving these challenges and addressing them. Um, but they've been crucial, and I I think they're going to continue to be really as we, as we move forward through the next year or so of trying to to make this happen. Another thing you mentioned that that uh, there's some questions circulating around this. I, I'm not so sure how to ask it, but you 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 mentioned something I thought was um, intriguing. Do you think, and uh, if you could if you could wave a magic wand, but the fact that you have existing tolls on certain facilities and not others, do you? So I'm, I'm I guess from your comments that you think that that hurt the congestion pricing, um, you know, the the push. Would it have been easier if they weren't told? Would it be easier if they were all told? Or is that just an artifact um, of, of history you have to deal with? I think it's an artifact of history you have to deal with. I mean, some of the, the, the plans that, that did, you know, I mentioned Move New York, which is the coalition that's kind of been uh, advancing this for, for some period of time. Their proposal was, hey, let's reduce some of the, the tolls that are far away from Manhattan in the outer boroughs where there's less traffic, it's less congested. And let's actually make a rational toll system where, you know, there's really a scarcity for space on our streets. And so I think that kind of approach, if you were, you know, if you are going to um, reduce some of the outer borough tolls and increase some of the tolls coming into um, into the densest parts of Manhattan, you, you could gain some traction there because you really rationalize the system. So I think that the tolling structure, when people say, look at it and they say, oh, it's ridiculous, you have to pay $14 or $15 to go here, but $2 to go here, nothing to go here. You put it on a map, people, I think, understand that and respond. Um, right. So so that's one so that's one way I think the existing tolls can actually help us. And if you live around, if you live around the, the free bridges, 20 to 30 percent of your traffic in your neighborhood is actually going to those free bridges. So for those mm -hmm. communities, there's a real there's a real incentive um, uh, to actually put the, a more rational tolling structure in place, so you don't have all of these people diverting, you know, to come to their neighborhood to tra travel across the Brooklyn Bridge, for example, which is free. Sure, sure. And I think it's related then to these a lot of questions here about the transit networks, and again, these are mostly questions from folks around the country. That I mean, clearly. Pricing like this needs dense transit networks in order to work. I think it's the lessons we heard from Singapore and London, Stockholm, places like that. It, it, and clearly it can work in New York because of that. Are there any other places, do you think, it's maybe an unfair question for you in New York, but are there any other places around the country where you think that they could also benefit from this cordon strategy because they have the dense networks, the dense urban areas are going to support it? Well, I, I mean, I know Seattle and L.A. Are, are looking into it, and it would be really embarrassing for New York if L.A. gets it first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, in, in the fourth regional plan, we, we recommended um, congestion pricing and movement towards vehicle miles traveled fees, not only for the cordon of Manhattan, but also for some of our very congested highways. Um, so I think it is a, 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 an approach we're going to, you know, continue to talk about beyond just the sort of dense urban core, but a way of addressing congestion and, and raising revenue. I mean, you have transportation funding crises in like every state we work in. I don't know what the situation is across the country, but I suspect um, many states are fa facing similar problems and looking for new ways um, to raise revenue to address this stuff. Right, right, right. It's definitely a national conversation. And there are a bunch of, the thing that I think that is common nationally, especially in bigger places are 
is the use of TNCs and and for higher vehicles and the effect that that's that this has all had. Have you has there been any um, any reaction, any any ramifications from the proposal on the for higher vehicles in New York, given that that's the phase one of these plans so far? The for higher vehicles are uh, uh, companies are part of the pro congestion pricing group. They support congestion pricing. They've been very vocally in support of it, um, and so. You know they've they 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 want to see a a solution to the problem. Um, you know so they they support they sub, they want a more comprehensive approach. Um, I don't think anyone would be happy if we just institute the four higher fees and and not get the rest of the package done. And so we're all going to keep working together on that um, over the next year or so. Sure. And politically, the governor and folks have said that this is that this is phase one. A comprehensive plan is coming soon. Clearly, RPA is going to keep working on it. Um, is there a feeling that this is that this it truly is phase one, or is it going to have to? Is it we're going to have to keep? Is it one step forward, two steps back, kind of thing? I think you know. I think we we have a, a, a we need to continue to make our case. Um, and there's you know the the thing about what's happening now is our subways and buses are in such a dire state, and I think they're just going to stay that way unless we really um really uh do some new uh approaches here so i i don't think the conversation is going to go anywhere um in terms of needing more resources for our transit system it's been consistent for you know 10 15 years and i think it's even more urgent now so it, sure, in that sure. way it's not going away we're not going to let it go away um the governor you know he, he doesn't usually say things unless he actually means it so um we're going to try and work with him and and get this done well, is there any other kind of plan B? You probably don't even want to think about this, but is there anything like they're doing um, cordon pricing here in the Washington, D.C. region? We have a, a, a highway in northern Virginia that has dynamic tolls on it. Um, is there anything that's that a palatable plan B or has it got to be the comprehensive approach or nothing else is going to work there? I mean, there's been a lot of different approaches, um, a lot of different um, plans put forward. But most of the studies I've I've seen have showed that without the cordon zone pricing and whatever that fee is, you can argue what it should be. But without the cordon zone, the benefits of um, Im improvements in transit, uh, the revenue you had, and the potential benefits of reduction in traffic are not nearly what we need to get to. Um, so I think we really need the cordon toll at the very least um, to address these problems. And I think that the numbers that you know are out there have have really bore that to bear. I think that's right, and and, um, and again, if it's, it, it should it should be able to get done in New York if you can get it done anywhere else. Um, the a couple two more things the the London plan, uh, as soon as it was put in place, the next day they had several hundred new buses operating on the streets. Do you know if there is any kind of plan in New York for that kind of rapid investment in transit to accompany uh, a congestion pricing plan that's comprehensive like you proposed? Yeah, I mean, the Fix NYC um, panel report recommended boosting transit service before you put the, the cordon toll in, before you put congestion pricing in, and we absolutely support that and, and think it needs to happen. That's why we are so happy that the new he head of New York City Transit, Andy Byford, came out with a plan to improve buses, because fundamentally, if you're going to fix the subways, you got to get more people onto the bus system in New York. Um, and once you start doing that, then maybe, you know, you can kind of um, um, see uh, the benefits of congestion pricing and you'll have the uh, capacity to be able to bring more people onto the transit system. So that's absolutely part of it. That $400 um, million that's going to be raised from the four higher fees is going into transit. And um, the idea is that you boost transit service, especially in the outer boroughs, largely, you know, on bus lines, and then, you know, maybe you have more, you have the capacity um, to be able to, to turn the tolls on in a couple of years. Right, right, right. It seems like they would have to go hand in hand for sure. So, when there's one Absolutely. more. So, there are a lot of folks on the phone from all across the country. The LA folks, I think, were particularly um, happy to hear your comments about maybe LA will come first. <laughs> we got some uh, <laughs> good comments about that one. Um, so how do you and so what are just a couple of lessons for folks around the country from your experience there going through this? Uh, you have the scars to prove it. What should folks take away from your experience there? I don't know. Keep fighting. You know, a lot of the people that, that I'm working with now on this, we work together 
some years ago. Um, and, you know, if you have a smart plan in place, things can change really quickly if you have a leader who's willing to consider the ideas. So, um, you know, I think I think if you just keep fighting and keep keep moving forward, um, we, we really had to address the equity issues up front. And I think that's something we're still suffering with. We kind of let the last time around, I think the, the messaging kind of got a, um, out of our hands and people started calling this a regressive tax. And the numbers just did not and do not um, show that. Um, so I think if you see some sort of dangerous kind of um, statements coming from people, you got to really um, address them up front and debunk them um, before they gain the kind of public um, public attention and people start repeating them over and over again. Sure. So focus on a comprehensive approach that includes transit. Make sure you pay attention closely to equity concerns and keep on fighting. Those are those are three really great uh, really great lessons for folks. So. Kate, I really want to thank you for taking the time. We're right about at a half an hour. I want to be respectful of everybody's um, time. Um, Kate Slevin, thank you so much for um, talking to us about this. And thank you, everybody, for your participation on the phone. We had great, great questions. We couldn't even come close to getting to all of them. We're going to stay involved in this issue here at Eno. As you heard, RPA is going to stay involved in this issue. So please reach out to any of us if you have any questions, comments. Um, and we'd love to see this uh, become a major issue around, around the country. Um, I also want folks not to forget that our next ENO webinar is going to be focused on DC, on Washington, D.C.'s dockless bike share pilot that's going to be on May 10th, uh, so pay attention to that. And our leadership development conference dinner also going to be here in Washington on May 24th. Um, you can find a lot of information about ENO and all of our events on our ENO's website, www.enotrans.org. There you can subscribe to ENO Transportation Weekly, which is really an invaluable resource on all aspects of transportation policy and practice. So again, many, many thanks to, to Kate for taking the time to educate all of us. And thank you all um, for your participation. Great, Have thank a great you, day, everybody. take care. Take care.